Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Today our discussion will be on high cholesterol. I'm your host, Heike Turciano. Um, this is a fairly uh, somewhat controversial subject as there are different theories on whether cholesterol in and of itself causes cardiovascular or heart disease. And I'm going to present some data and information to you that hopefully will allow you to make a more informed decision. Um, first of all, I want you to have an idea about what cholesterol is. It's a waxy type of substance that every cell in the body requires in order to function. Your nerve cells, your brain cells, um, as well as your sexual hormone production. Very, very important uh, for that as well. Um, doctors tend to focus on uh, two uh, uh, lipoproteins uh, regarding this. The low density lipoproteins which are listed as your LDL and HDL which is your high density lipid, lipid proteins. Your LDL are carriers uh, for cholesterol uh, in the bloodstream and your HDL is kind of like the good old housewife that comes back afterwards and cleans up that LDL. Um, when we're talking about what tends to cause high cholesterol, uh, there's a lot of different factors that affect that. Um, genetics and heredity, uh, how your liver uh, produces or metabolizes or utilizes or gets rid of cholesterol. Um, a, a surprising fact that most people don't realize is that 75 to 85 percent of cholesterol is produced in the liver. So diet has, or additional amounts of dietary cholesterol, have very little effect uh, on the actual overall cholesterol production by the liver. We'll talk about other things that do affect that production of cholesterol. Um, foods high in saturated fat and trans fats are a contributing factor to liver inflammation and the liver becoming sluggish so that it finds the need to increase cholesterol production. Lack of exercise and circulation, smoking, and probably one of the key factors regarding uh, cholesterol is diabetes or high blood sugars. Uh, the reason being is these uh, high blood sugars uh, cause the blood to become very, very sticky. Uh, the red blood cells, uh, then you get an increase in the LDL. There's a French study that showed, however, that these blood sugars or the spike in insulin versus the actual cholesterol increase is what actually was the best measurement for cardiovascular disease. Um, our physicians or our medical establishment tend to focus on the uh, LDL, HDL, and something called VLDL as being uh, indicators for uh, risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. But it appears as though there's some studies that support more that insulin and blood sugars might be a better uh, indicator in that regard. Risk uh, factors regarding high cholesterol and what is called uh, cholesterol oxidation. Um, what happens is this cholesterol can become oxidized, and there's some contributing factors that we'll talk about later on, that cause cholesterol to build up in the vascular system. Uh, thereby making the arteries narrow with time. Um, when we're talking about uh, LDL and HDL, LDL will go in and repair uh, or tend to smooth out these vascular uh, imperfections, and then HDL comes along and cleans it up. When uh, you get the testings for cholesterol, you'll usually see a ratio measurement at the bottom of your test that tells you whether you're low risk or medium risk or high risk. And generally, as a rule, if your ratios of LDL to HDL are four to one, then you tend to be average or lower risk. So if it's four to one or less. So for example, if you have a, uh, uh, an LDL of 160 and an HDL of 50, your ratios are very good, whereas your over cholesterol, overall cholesterol might be 210. Uh, the medical establishment has set a 200 uh, as being the setting for total overall cholesterol, uh, and that has changed through the years, going from 240 to 220 to 200. And now some physicians are recommending cholesterol even be dropped further. Um, the National Health Institute 
a very important study that they did in a culmination of data found that there was no direct, direct link between cholesterol levels and heart attack or stroke. So, ah, this gets you thinking, okay, you know, if there's no direct link, why are we so worried about lowering the cholesterol? Okay, indirectly cholesterol affects it, but there's other major contributing factors that seem to be uh, more uh, contributing causes to uh, arteriosclerosis or heart disease. Um, Another thing that tends to raise cholesterol oxidation or cholesterol is the lack of antioxidants, hydrogenated fats like margarine, uh, cancer-causing chemicals, uh, pesticides, uh, synthetic sweeteners, anything that's chemical-based that cause what's, what's called an oxidation, which is kind of a rusting of the vascular system. Uh, will uh, cause a rise in uh, cholesterol or cause cholesterol oxidation. Okay, something that physicians oftentimes don't focus on that um, I have a grave concern about is I, I hear this, let's get your LDL below 100, you know, you're at lower risk. The concern is there is something called hypocholestemia and what that literally means is when the cholesterol drops below 140, then you have what is called low cholesterol. And low cholesterol can contribute to manic depression, uh, mood uh, issues, the inability of the vascular system to repair itself, the cells uh, not being able to repair, inability to heal. There's so many different factors associated with lowering cholesterol too low. So keeping in mind that we want cholesterol to be down, but not too low. There was a Japanese study that basically found that when cholesterol ranged between about 180 and 220 with maintaining that within four to one ratio uh, of LDL to HDL, the cardiovascular risk dropped significantly. Okay. I'd like to move on to uh, explaining, and this is a very important part of Ne something that's necessary to help either lower cholesterol or reduce uh, inflammation in the vascular system to keep that cholesterol from building up. Good fats versus bad fats. Uh, I hear uh, physicians quite often say, okay, I want you to keep your fat as low as you possibly can, and I kind of gasp because I recognize that there's differences between fats. And I think it's kind of important to give you a little background so you're aware of what the good fats are versus the bad fats. Um, Plant-based omega-6 fats, such as borage oil, walnuts, almonds, pecans, uh, hemp, flax, actually reduce inflammation in the vascular system and cause, uh, uh, obviously when you reduce the inflammation down, it can prevent those blockages and clots. So remembering now, for some reason, everybody's kind of lumped omega-6s together. There are plant-based omega-6s that are very, very helpful at lowering cholesterol and reducing inflammation. Okay. Now, the omega-6s that we refer to as kind of being the bad fats, you have to have some of them because saturated fats are necessary for, for cellular repair and uh, cellular function. Um, the omega-6, what we call bad fat, where we don't want to have excessive amounts of them because they contribute to arterial inflammation and that oxidation word we used before, which oxidation is the kind of the rusting of the vascular system, uh, would be uh, from meat, dairy, trans fats, which are like your margarines, those types of things you want to avoid. Also, uh, some physicians, and there's some good studies that are coming out on this regarding omega-3 uh, oils and there are plant-based ones and there are also uh, fish oil based omega-3s. Uh, omega-3 uh, nuts have them, flax has them, fish has them and basically what they're finding these omega-3 oils are doing is they're helping to lower the cholesterol, reduce inflammation which includes reducing inflammation in the liver itself and when you reduce inflammation in the liver it's a little happy camper and it moves along a lot better and the cholesterol comes down reducing blood stickiness and inflammation. So you're not gonna get that uh, coagulation of, of the blood uh, causing or contributing to cardiovascular disease or to strokes. 
So, when we discuss diet as a uh, contributing factor to either, either help or contribute uh, to cholesterol levels, what I found in the research uh, out there that has clinical data backing uh, the following things I, we find to be very, very helpful and mindful of. High fiber, water soluble fibers. So you're not talking about your wheat bran. We're talking about water soluble fibers. And water soluble fibers would include fibers from fruits, veggies, whole grains. They found overall that they reduced what's called blood serum cholesterol levels. That means the cholesterol that's roaming around in the vascular system. And it also helps attach these and take them into the bowel and remove them as well. Veggie juices, such as carrots, celery, beet juice, uh, help increase bile secretion, which cleans the liver, gets the liver moving, so that the liver isn't so sluggish and, and responds better. Um, you obviously have to be careful with uh, carrot and beet juice if you're diabetic because it will affect uh, blood sugars. Using unrefined oils, that means oils that aren't heat treated, uh, they're cold pressed types of oils, uh, in which literally they have cold presses that press the oil out of the plants, including flax, olive, hemp, grape seed. Uh, as discussed earlier, these are omega-3 types of oils that can help lower the cholesterol and reduce the inflammation in the vascular system. Now when we're talking about the types of dietary things necessary uh, to reduce cholesterol or reduce vascular inflammation, and that's really what this is all about. I think the focus really needs to be um, by our medical establishment or all healthcare professionals is how we can reduce the vascular inflammation so the cholesterol doesn't stick. When the vascular system gets jagged, the body sends a message to the liver that we need to produce cholesterol to smooth those arteries out so we can keep the blood supply going. When we reduce the vascular inflammation down, then we don't have those jagged edges forming in, in the vascular system. So the things that contribute, uh, that cause cholesterol to stick on the vascular system or cause uh, sticky blood, so where the cholesterol can gather and collect, uh, or, ox or oxidize, rust, um, avoiding all hydrogenated oils. Um, sh like I said, shortening, margarines. You're going to look for those hydrogenated oils when you're looking for ingredients um, on, on your food products. Cereals, crackers, oh, notorious for that. Uh, bread products uh, using hydrogenated oils. Uh, protein shakes or certain protein shakes out on the market that add hydrogenated oils to make you feel full, but they're very bad for you. I mean, they cause your vascular system to just get inflamed and, and oxidize the cholesterol. So, and then avoiding alcohol and refined sugar or flour. As mentioned earlier, there was a study uh, done regarding insulin spikes. When the blood sugar rises, the body increases insulin production in order to get the blood sugars to absorb and be utilized. Well, when we have alcohol, which is pure sugar, and we have sugar or refined types of carbohydrates, it spikes the blood sugars, and when you spike those blood sugars, then they in turn cause vascular inflammation as well. So things you want, things you want to avoid, being aware. Okay, exercise, and anytime before you start a exercise program, you need to um, recognize that you need to consult with a hair, uh, healthcare professional before you start an, an exercise program. But regular exercise appears to be able to normalize LDL uh, as well as help raise the HDL level and increase circulation, the blood moving. Okay? You must be aware that there are certain drugs that can raise cholesterol, very mindful, steroids, oral contraceptives, diuretics, beta blockers, which are used for hypertensive, uh, high blood pressure, uh, and then certain types of drugs used for Parkinson's. So you need to check with your doctor or your pharmacist if you're seeing elevated cholesterol that you need to address uh, that maybe the drugs may be a contributing factor in that regard. Um, I've listed uh, a number of supplements that I have found and that are very well researched on here and uh, the cameras are picking up so that you can hopefully write some of these down. Uh, fish oil, a really good study that just actually just recently came out 
uh, of 32,000 participants showed a 19 to 45% reduction in cardiovascular events heart attacks, strokes, things regarded, uh, regarding the uh, cardiovascular system. Three to four grams of fish oil lowered triglycerides in their study 20 to 50 percent. So I've been seeing a lot of physicians recommending fish oils. Make sure your fish oils are really clean source that it says on the bottle PCP and mercury free. Very, very, very important. Niacin uh, is listed, uh, can raise HDL, lower LDL. Vitamin C. Uh, there's a famous researcher out of, the, uh, out of Germany, a German researcher, and basically he found that using high dosages of mineral ascorbate uh, vitamin C lowers uh, cholesterol by increasing uh, HDL carriers to remove those uh, cholesterol serums or cholesterol uh, out of the body. They also prevent oxygenation uh, oxidation and restore the vascular system flexibility because it helps with the collagen matrix as well. Other things, apple and grapefruit uh, pectin, a uh, bind of fats. Garlic, clinical study uh, on four to 500 milligrams twice a day, lower cholesterol nine to 12 percent. Lecithin, fat emulsification uh, in the vascular system. Uh, help to remove uh, some of the cholesterol buildups. And then there's other things such as uh, polycosinols, artichoke extract uh, that lower cholesterol. There are many, many other things like cinnamon and other types of supplements that can help lower cholesterol. So looking at the variety, I'm just giving you a few here so that you can research and make a determination and then addressing those issues about that vascular inflammation and the cholesterol buildups. This is the uh, informational portion of our uh, show. Next, we'd like to present you with the fitness section. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of Fit and Healthy Today. I'd like to show you a few exercises that may help with balance, with hip flexor strength. Uh, first, I'd like to start with balance. I see a lot of my customers particularly as they grow on in senior years, having issues with balance. This is a kind of a modification of a yoga pose called the mountain pose. And if you can have a chair handy or something to secure yourself if you're not quite full in balance. And what it does is you bring your leg up to your knee and you hold that. And then you do your best to remove your hands and try and balance and hold that for 30 seconds to a minute. And then, of course, changing sides, getting that balance as well. Um, balance is very important for prevention of falls, particularly uh, as we grow older, or just balance, period, uh, for overall um, being able to perform everyday acts as well. Um, when we're talking about strengthening or worrying about uh, inner thigh areas, I have a lot of my particularly female customers complain about the little flabbies going on here in the inner thighs. What we do is we do something called a duck squat. And the feet get turned outward and we put the legs apart. And this is kind of like an old ballet plie and it used to go like this. But what you do is you turn your feet out and you go down and you can hold on to your trusty chair if you're unsteady and back up. And you squeeze the rear end when you come back up again and down and back up again. What that does is that hits the inner thigh area and hopefully will tighten some of those muscles in that inner thigh area and give you additional inner thigh strength. Um, as far as hip flexors, I want to show you a few exercises for strengthening your hip flexors. I see this a lot with unsteadiness with seniors and with people who tend to have weight problems and if we can help strengthen those hip flexors it can increase the mobility of them and the balance of them and as a trainer these were a couple of the exercises uh, that I showed okay you get on the floor you keep your back nice and flat and nice and straight and all you're going to do is you're going to just kick out to where your leg is straight and bring it back and then kick out and bring it back like 10 or 15 repetitions on uh, each side of the uh, the body a couple of times uh, maybe two or three times a week to try and strengthen and then also working on the side flexors um, keeping the back nice and straight and looking straight ahead as best as your balance will allow you uh, the hip flexor uh, motion and mobility that will help strengthen uh, that area and, or just make it a little bit more flexible 
Uh, that concludes our fitness portion of the show. We next move on to our informational research analyst, Ralph Turciano. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. Uh, today, Ralph Turciano will be presenting the latest, greatest research available. Ralph? Yes. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss more, a little bit of the research, but also some concerns about those of us which are in charge of taking care of our health. But first, I'd like to open up with the first one. Artificial butter from popcorn and other sources seems to create some issues, at least in animals right now, especially the microwave popcorn, containing a chemical called dicetyl. Now what it does, it seems to cause obliterative bronchitis, meaning what ends up happening is fibrous or fibrous tissue builds up in the lungs in which you cannot expel through coughing. It is a concern, and the main concern here is to try to pressure manufacturers of this artificial butter to change your sources. Very simple to do. Until then, if people had asthma or any other respiratory problems or concerns, the best thing I can recommend doing is avoiding artificial butter until manufacturers do address those concerns. It's just not worth it. After that, some interesting research from England and also in, uh, basically in correlation with Cardiff University in regards to black tea. Now, we live in a pretty safe environment, but if there ever was a curve where an anthrax breakout should happen, they discovered that black tea works very well in inhibiting anthrax activity. Now, the catch here is this. It has to be black tea. It cannot be black tea mixed in with milk. They found out that milk cancels out the polyphenol effects of that black tea. That article was published in the March issue of the Society of Applied Microbiology, uh, Journal for Microbiologists, which I found quite interesting. After that, we go on to something which really involves our children. Now, interesting enough, they started adding a supplement to some children's diets upon birth to see how they fared. It was vitamin D. And this is another big feather in the cap for vitamin D itself. What appears is when vitamin D is given to young children, the chance of developing type 1 diabetes drops down by about 29%. Now, this indicates a couple different things. One, that maybe type 1 diabetics, or type 1 diabetes, I should say, is not an inevitability based upon genetics. There may be genetic predisposition, but there may be, may be other factors involved. And two, that if you add vitamin D to a child's diet, then depriving vitamin D of that child's diet can also result in these conditions. Meaning, is type 1 diabetes a nutritional issue? Or is it just basically a biological issue which is unavoidable? Well, after this uh, study where, where vitamin D was added to their diet in that substantial reduction, they have to relook at this issue again. And that was basically some interesting reporting as opposed to some other local news channels which decided to say that children do not need multivitamins without basing it upon any credible information or data. Now some, for some really good reporting which I have to give credit to the Associated Press on this one. This was good old-fashioned investigative reporting. It comes down to our water supply and being contaminated with pharmaceuticals. Now the catch is this. It's not so much the contamination of pharmaceuticals. We can easily say, hey, you know what? We were unaware. We are going to try to work to fix this problem. That's not what concerns me. What concerns me more than anything else is basically the contaminated thinking that revolves around this subject of our water supply, one of our primary necessary, can't do without resources that you need for life. What we saw here is politicians, researchers, and business leaders try to dodge the bullet on this one totally, with total disregard for public whatsoever information-wise, testing-wise, or otherwise. So basically, what we found out was this. And I'm going to give you a few quotes, which you'll find quite interesting. Keep in mind, we started understanding that our water supply was contaminated back from 1999. Then John Hopkins, back in back 2002, said, quote, that these pharmaceuticals are not rendered biologically harmless. And they said, quote, also, 
We may be able to tolerate them for a short period of time, but that doesn't mean they won't hurt us or developing fetuses or aquatic organisms at higher concentrations over a long period of time. They knew this for about five years, but when they finally began testing, what do we find out? Well, the AP reported, there are plenty of reasons offered for the secrecy, concerns about national security, fears of panic, a feeling the public will not understand, even confidentiality agreements. What's there to hide? And what you find out, as you begin to research this article a little bit more, providers are not how we're required to tell people if they find to contaminate that is not listed in the US EPA. And there are no pharmaceuticals on that EPA list. Well, listen, what would you do? Think about this. What would you do if you had a babysitter and they said your child ate some bad food? But would not tell you what it is, how much they ate, or when they ate it. That's a responsibility. And yes, government does sometimes work in a paternalistic form. But this one is unbelievable. Let's go to one quote which I cannot understand. And I'll actually give you a couple of quotes. The one quote I cannot understand is one from one individual who found out his water supply was contaminated, Mayor Robert Chuck. What did he say? Let's look at the logic of this afterwards too. Mayor Robert Chuck, Cluck, I sorry, apologize, Cluck, said a trace amount of one pharmaceutical had survived the treatment process and had been detected in drinking water. He declined to name the drug, saying identifying it could cause a terrorist to intentionally release more of it, causing significant harm to residents. After that, he followed by saying, I don't want to take that chance. There is no public hazard, and I don't want to create one. Now you think about that. If there's no public hazard to the medication that's contaminating the water supply, then who cares what a terrorist does with it? You cannot use the logic, well, if I tell you what's poisoning you, then the terrorists win. Basically begins to make you real, really rethink who your friends are on this issue. And then it goes on to two. We are not putting out more information than we have to put out, said Rhodes. How about that? Now, Rhodes also worked for one of the businesses that's basically purified water. And he responded not just in a regular way, but he incited. After that, basically they found out, the AP, that people do not have to say where they obtain the water samples, what water samples are contaminated, or how much they're contaminated by. Stayed in confidentiality agreements with they make with the plants, which say they allow us to test the water, but we can't tell you. But let's end with this one quote. That was basically from one of my favorite quotes from Peter Rogers, Harvard University professor of environmental engineering. He said, quote, and remember this is Harvard University again. I would stop those measurements right away because if you measure something, it will get out and people will overreact. I can just imagine a whole slew of lawsuits. If you test something, you may find it. Let's leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph, for your uh, very informative information. This concludes our show. Thank you very much for joining us.